Most trading card games last only two years. Time and time again, we see them make the same mistakes and crumble for the same reason. Falling victim to the seven deadly sins of trading card games. An attribute is an identifier used in card games that help distinguish and organize different cards from one another. This is not to be confused with card type, which defines the role that a card has on the playing field, spell, creature, resource, etc., but instead a way to classify the cards into different sets and categories in order to support variety. These attributes have many names, color, type, civilization, element, clan, whatever, and they carry with them some sort of limitation, such as requiring a matching resource card or only benefiting cards that share a certain keyword. A restraining bolt where pooling some weaker cards in with only a few of the stronger cards can actually be better than just piling on the strong cards thanks to a higher level of consistency. These exist not only to promote a sense of variety, but also to pump the brakes on allowing players to simply combine the game's strongest cards together to create a scenario where there is only one good deck, a permanent tier zero phenomenon. But is it possible to take this too far? Giving your attributes a distinct playstyle can encourage players to stick to them in order to get the most consistent deck, but one thing players also enjoy is exploring additional options. Players love the chance to put their own spin on a strategy, put their name on a unique combination, or build that hero-villain dream team. But for some games, that sort of thing just really isn't in the cards now, is it? A lot of games take their attributes so far that the idea of any sort of cross-pollination between multiple attributes is unthinkable. Sometimes it's a hard rule stating that cards of different attributes cannot be used together, other times it's a soft rule that, while it doesn't explicitly state it, still has that effect nonetheless. For an example of a hard rule, let's look at two games, Huntick and Austin Powers. Both of these games actually have the exact same two attributes, good and evil. You must make a deck of either one or the other, and a good deck must play against an evil deck. Austin Powers does this to such an extreme that good and evil cards actually have different card backs. The problem here is kind of obvious though. I mean, how are you supposed to run a tournament bracket when your players consist of 17 good decks and two evil ones? That's just bad rule writing in general. Another hard example would be the flags in Buddy Fight, which explicitly state the types of cards you are allowed to use. These are a bit of an interesting case, and I'll talk more about these later. A soft rule is something that might more easily fly under a developer's radar, a rule that makes the process of mixing attributes so consistently suboptimal that players will avoid it at all costs. Magi Nation's regional penalties, where Magi must play an additional cost to use spells or creatures of another region, and cannot use the all-powerful relics of another region at all, acts as a soft rule blocking attribute mixing. Trigger interactions in Cardfight Voldemort have the same effect, though it actually has a hard rule against mixing in its standard format, Clan Fight. But you know, while such harsh division between attributes is annoying, stifling creativity and preventing the introduction of so-called staple cards which can find a home in nearly any deck and can remain a stable foundation for players of any skill level, but isn't this show more about how certain design decisions actually bring harm to a brand? For an extreme example, we'll take a look at... My nemesis. As I've mentioned before, Cardfight Vanguard has a set of rules called Clan Fight that forbid the mixing of decks outside of very specific instances. Instances caused by Protagonist Syndrome, something that happens with a lot of Bushiroad shows where cards used by their main characters are allowed to break the rules. Huh. Anyway, the fact that Vanguard decks don't permit any form of clan mixing at all creates a bit of a problem considering there are 24 of them. Yeah, that's a lot. Actually, am I going crazy? Because I'm counting 27. Either way, the problem here is obvious. How do you support so many unmixable clans at once? Let's do a quick exercise here to show off what I mean. A typical trading card game booster set tends to contain anywhere between roughly 80 and 300 different cards, though sets of this size are limited to base or core sets which either launch a game or are riddled with reprints. A more accurate average would be 120 cards. But with 24 clans, how can you support them with an average set size of 120? 
equally split that sun and then carry the two. Just five cards per region, which is far from enough to do much of anything. Definitely not enough to build a deck of 50 cards with a four card copy limit. Even if you double the set size to 240, that's still not enough to build a deck of any clan with, let alone be a good place for any new player to start or for a player who has only one or two decks to try to fish for useful cards. Bushiroad's solution to this problem is to include fewer clans in each set. Rather than all 24 clans, what if each set contained only four of them? That way, in a set of 120, each clan featured gets 30 whole cards to work with. You could provide two decks worth of cards per clan in that case, but uh, that creates its own host of problems. Let's say, for example, a set is released that supports Oracle Think Tank, Grand Blue, Nova Grappler, and Death Eaters. I mean, people should be excited for the new set, right? But what if the reaction was instead... Well, I play Gear Chronicle, so uh, I don't really care. Yeah, this system of having four clans per set means that the other 83% of them are left out of the loop, which results in the very real probability that you are releasing a product that the vast majority of your players won't really care about. For a bit of perspective, this would be like if Magic the Gathering released an entire booster set that contained only white and blue cards. I'm sure blue and white players would be thrilled, but people who run red, green, black, or artifact decks, maybe not so much. Then again, Magic system is a lot more forgiving, and even those other decks have a chance to splash in those colors. Even Yu-Gi-Oh! with its hard-baked archetypes can generate excitement with their sets as there's always a chance that it might contain some new cards that help these old archetypes out, giving them just the new staples they need to see play again. But in the case of Vanguard, it really is an all-or-nothing ordeal. Either a clan gets a ton of cards in a set, or it gets nothing at all. This can lead to huge gaps in support for any given clan, as even if a new set packs in four clans, the four from the previous set get put back on the underserved list. At a normal pace, this means that the vast majority of their clans would have to wait roughly a year and a half to get any new cards. So in order to handle this new problem that they've created, Bushiroad handles this by chucking product out the back end faster than a bull elephant on a diet of Metamucil. Bushiroad puts out a new booster product every month. That's three times more often than most other games, which of course creates even more problems. Game stores can only handle so much product and frequently operate on very narrow margins. So unless Vanguard sells really well, and I mean really well, it doesn't take much time for stores to be inundated with backstock, which their limited footprints can't really handle so well. Not to mention, if your first few booster sets are full of unpopular clans and you get shafted with four sets of cards that nobody is interested in buying, why would you keep going? This was the reason given by every store I asked about it. The product just doesn't sell well enough for how fast it piles up. And a popular response to a video I used to have is that the game is apparently growing? Despite the fact that the number of stores that carry it is shrinking? Either what's happened is the fan base has consolidated around just a few stores, or a bunch of bozos are off buying all of their cards on the internet and yet still expecting their local stores to host tournaments and events. So yeah, if you're a store thinking of running Vanguard, good freaking luck! The product load will be constant and the sales will be tepid at best unless you're already deep in the market for it. Not even my local game store, located on a college campus in a tax-free state, a store considered important enough by Bushiroad that they flew the CEO himself there to promote the game Dragoborn, could get Vanguard off the ground in more recent times. They were even having trouble selling the packs at half price. Bushiroad have dug themselves a pretty deep hole, constantly churning out core products that a good portion of their audience won't even care about and that stores have to take the penalty on. A problem caused by having so many dang exclusive attributes. Vanguard may have a sound base concept, but boy did this design decision really drag that into the ground. Not even their recent restructuring fixed this problem. If anything, it made things worse by wiping out the value of people's collections and all of their stock trigger units. Okay, yeah. Vanguard is a very extreme example of this sin. But it's worth mentioning that these sins aren't necessarily a death sentence for a TCG, but they're often a source of tremendous hassle. And this element of design is an enormous bugbear on Vanguard's back. 
It's also worth noting that Vanguard is the only really successful game to involve unmixable attributes, and it only does so with great difficulty that harms its chances for growth. So where does the line happen? How do we use attributes in a way that doesn't necessarily constrict creativity, but isn't so loose that it opens the floodgate to tier zero strategies again? Well, for most card games, they give each card multiple attributes. Now, I don't mean like multicolor cards, although you could go with that as well. I mean multiple sets of attributes that interact with each other in different ways, using what I call primary attributes and secondary attributes. For example, in the Dragon Ball Super card game, the cards come in one of four colors. Or you could be pedantic and say there's five colors, though black is technically colorless. In order to put these cards into play, you have to use resource cards that match the card's colors. These are what I call primary attributes, attributes that have some sort of game rule attached to them. Other examples would be like mana and energy symbols from Magic and Pokemon, or the levels in Yu-Gi-Oh! However, these Dragon Ball cards also have little text identifiers that are instead more related to the characters and their histories. They might have descriptors like Saiyan or Frieza Army. These are secondary attributes, as there are technically no rules connected to them, but they do come up in various card effects and characters that can exist across several colors. These attributes are also commonly referred to as archetypes. For example, with this Golden Frieza Resurrected Terror, I could build an all-yellow deck for consistent resources, or I could combine it with other Frieza army cards across several colors, sacrificing color consistency in order to benefit from the color variety, tied together with cards that apply to Frieza army cards regardless of color. Not only does this nudge players into trying different builds and strategies, but it also creates a spectrum of deck concepts between the simply consistent and the just plain wild, where people create truly out there strategies using far reaching card combinations you never saw coming. Although if they get a little too out there, that's what a ban list is for. In order to facilitate the ability to mix these attributes, most games allow a certain amount of flexibility with their primary attributes. Those that use color symbols tend to allow part of a card's cost to be paid using resources that don't match, such as the gray numbers of magic cards and the white stars in Pokemon that can be paid with any resource, and on the flip side, the dots in Dragon Ball, which indicate how much of the cost must be paid with the correct resource. You can turn this into a sliding scale, creating cards that are more or less suitable for mixing with other primary attributes. Games without costs also tend to have multicolor cards or use secondary attributes to allow certain forms of mixing. Body Fight has a flag system that determines what sorts of cards one can use, usually tied to a particular color or world, but other flags instead look for secondary attributes with what they allow to play, creating a decent amount of constructive freedom even in a game with this sort of strict design. The new Digimon game as well. While you can only Digivolve or play option cards if you have a Digimon of the matching color, you can play Digimon from your hand of any color at any time, so mixing or splashing colors is a simple matter. Hearthstone may have its class exclusive cards that can only go into decks with certain avatars. However, it does have a couple of things working in its favor. First of all, it has a robust set of universal cards to the point where even at high levels of play, a deck might even be on average one third universal cards. You can also take all of your old and unwanted cards and convert them into Stardust to buy the cards that you really want, ignoring things such as market value, availability, or demand. A good card game system allows a great deal of experimentation that is tempered by attributes in order to add a few hurdles to people trying to string together the strongest cards, while also providing a sense of structure for new players in the game, where they have a foothold that they can latch onto rather than just turning them loose in their vast sea of cards, but also not pigeonholing players into little attribute cubicles that they're not allowed to step out of. A good card game allows creativity, and unmixable attributes really doesn't allow that to happen. Keep that in mind, and you too can avoid falling victim to one of the seven deadly sins of trading card games.